in for tuning in, and well, I would like to welcome Pastor Stephen. I am thankful that the Lord uh, passed my talent on to my daughter, and uh, my wife didn't have anything to do with that, so that's an honor. <laughs> We have very talented and gifted, three, all three of our kids are just sweet and we're so proud of them and so thankful for them. And I do want to thank each and every one of you on Facebook and you here that's been praying for Kara. As you can tell, she's feeling better and able to join us tonight and we're just so thankful. Amen? Amen. And could that not have been a more on-time song for what we're going through as a nation? That's right. The Lord's been dealing with my heart and, and, uh, and I want to share some scripture with you. The thing that I love about God's Word is it's so on time, and it, it, there is nothing that we face that God's Word doesn't give an insight to how we should handle it, contend with it, deal with it, and what God's response is to it. Sometimes we overestimate God's response because we don't want to respond. I found in my own life, I want God to do it so I don't have to face it. But God didn't promise us that we wouldn't have to face challenges. He just said that he'd be with us. Amen? Amen. And I do want to warn you, uh, warn everybody here. I think it was Sister Donna and Lawrence Hurley who blessed your pastor and got him a brand new <laughs> joke book. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys if you're watching. And uh, this will, this will uh, uh, contribute to a lot of groans throughout the year. So I appreciate that. <laughs> One, one of which is, I've told some of you, let me share this with you before we get started, I love it. Why is it so much easier to do psychoanalysis on men? Because when you ask them to revert to their childhood, they're already there. <laughs> okay, let's go forward. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, the Word of God uh, to, to Romans chapter 13. I call it the government chapter. Amen. And what we've seen in our nation and what we're still going through, we're, uh, I'm 46 years old, and that lets you know that I voted many times. Voted, I got to vote for, let's see, who was my first vote? It was probably for George, the first George Bush. I think I got to vote for him. And I remember I also voted uh, when uh, Clinton was elected, and I voted when George, or when uh, George uh, w or H was collected, or one other, amen, and then I also got to vote when Obama was elected, and uh, yeah, the Bushes, amen, and not talking about the baked beans, amen, we're talking about Bushes, and uh, then I got to, of course, vote for President Trump last uh, term, and of course this year too, but the thing that I've learned is whether it is a Democrat in office or a Republican, and I know we've seen a lot of challenges and changes, but the thing that is... And I've heard Holden say this, and I quote Holden, Holden Williams, doesn't matter who is voted in on Tuesday, Wednesday, I still get to do the job that God's called me to do in the bed. It doesn't change the, the aptitude or the attitude of the church, but unfortunately, one thing that I've seen and I've, I've even experienced myself is the enemy is really, I mean, I've never dreamed that we would live in such a divided nation. That's right. I would honestly dare to say, and I've not done all the polls, but I would dare to say that our nation has not been this divided since the Civil War. Amen. That's right. And, uh, and the thing that concerns me, and even more than the nation being divided, but is the church divided. Yeah. And, you know, we have folks that, you know, we, we love to post our opinions. And, uh, and I like what Brother Randy said, you know, you can have your own opinion, but sometimes you've got to keep it to yourself. You know, if you know that you're antagonizing the person, sometimes, although you have every American right to say what you feel and believe and boast it, I believe we need to defend, and, and that's, that's one of the great things about America. But at the same time, if it causes a stumbling block to someone around you, if you're saying it to be mean or facetious or, or arrogant, and I know the thing, somebody said, well, they say it to me. Well, again, God doesn't deal with the response of the sinner. He deals with the response of those who call him Father. Amen. Amen. So, before we get started tonight, I want to talk to you just a few moments on Roman, Romans 13 and the American church. Could you point your hand this way? Let's just go before the Lord in prayer together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just thank you today. and I thank you, Lord, for your mercies and your grace. <clears throat> God, just as, as, as uh, Kara sung so beautifully, God, we belong to you. 
And God, I, I'm not alone in feeling the pain and the, and the fear and the anxiety. But God, I know that in 2016, there were those, there were Democrats and Christians who felt this same anxiety. And God, again, the thing is, we know that no matter who's on the seat of the White House, God, you're still on the throne. So God, give us your courage and your peace and your joy that, God, we will not be pinched by the enemy to act in a way that would bring a reproach to you. But God, let us lift your name. Let us lift your banner. And God, what if America doesn't lift that banner anymore? Mm. Well, if it doesn't, then God, it still doesn't mean the church can. Right. So Lord, we love you, we honor, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to guarantee you one of two things as we start this little bit of a message tonight. is somebody, whether it works by Facebook, or sitting here is going to have a different opinion than what I say. And like I said, you have every right to that opinion. Thank God for America. Yes. But at the same time, when our opinions meet the Word of God, we've got to line up to the Word of God. And if any of you tonight feel in any way or by Facebook that I am manipulating Scripture to prove a point, I, I urge you to challenge me. Please be polite and courteous, but challenge me, and I'll show you why I believe what I believe and where I got my information from. So, is that fair enough? Tonight in Romans 13, let's go, we, we, can't, we can't really jump into 13 by itself. We've got to have a little bit of a, a, a reference point here. And if we look at the culture, if we look at what was going on, and, and as Paul was writing this beautiful book, we know that the author was the Apostle Paul. We've just come out of the sermon series out of uh, the latter part of 1 Corinthians and all of 2 Corinthians. And I don't know about you, but it's fed my spirit. And... Uh, one thing I love about preaching and pastoring is it challenges me to learn more. And when I learn more to teach, then I learn more in here as well. Um, but I do want you to know that it was written around 60 AD. Uh, we understand, too, that Corinth was probably, uh, this was during Paul's uh, third missionary trip. You remember he was telling the church of Corinth that, hey, I want to come see you again. Well, this was written around that time. Uh, we understand, too, that Paul even said in, in 2 Corinthians, he tells them, he says, I, all the things that he's dealing with and all the things you talked to, remember he talked about being shipwrecked and everything else that he dealt with. And then he ends that chapter, I believe it was chapter 9 or chapter 10. He talks about his, his heart for the church. And he talks about how that although that he's been through this, he also carries the, the heart for his church that God's helped him to establish. So this is part of that effect of that caring. And he wrote this. Uh, to Rome, when Rome was facing increasing persecution. Uh, many had lost their jobs because of their faith. Uh, they had lost their possessions, their homes, their family, and even lost their freedom. And many had even lost their lives. And I'll be honest with you guys, I went through this scenario last night about 1 o'clock in the morning when I couldn't shut my mind off. And what tomorrow will hold, and what could this possibly be, and and the thing is, if you're a Democrat tonight, you look at a Republican a president and you automatically think of every horrible thing that could happen under this kind of administration. And the same thing is with us as conservatives. We look at someone who may be liberal who takes this the highest office in the world. Oh my goodness, what could happen and, and how will it change? We've listened to the political promises and some of the political promises, and we know what political promises are. Most of them are, are little incentives that you will go to the poll and put their name down on that, on that poll. And many of the promises that get made, even with Republican aspects or conservative aspects, are not completely fulfilled. Now, there may be limitations, or maybe it was just things that a lot of politicians said. I believe it was one, I, I think it was Eisenhower who promised everybody a chicken in every pot or something like that. And guess what? Even though everyone liked Ike, I couldn't do it. Amen? So we know that we have to face these promises, these inevitabilities, and also these insecurities that really challenge our heart. The first thing, even when I mentioned that, I just sense this in my heart, that there are those that's watching today, you get mad if I mention something about another poly, a party. And why, where we, where, why do we get here? I mean, why do we get as a nation, as a church, where we can't have a separate opinion and we have to hate each other over it? We claim that one party is, is racist and the other party is racist, but the thing is, when we won't come together, we hate each other because of political standing, we're, we're in a dangerous place. So we know that this isn't new. All through history, this has been something that's been addressed. And, and we find the Apostle Paul writing this letter to Rome. And, and again, they've lost so much and endured so much and gone through so much. Many will say that Romans, and, and I know that I, Brother Holden will say an amen to this, is considered by many to be Paul's most amazing and influential letter. As a matter of fact, it was written, it's, it's considered as, as a piece of literature itself. It's a masterpiece in how it's written. And uh, many will even tell you too, and I believe... 
uh, but it's, it's, it's such a complete book that if you have a, a new convert who has just come to Christ and they want to read something, let them read the book of Romans. Because what the book of Romans, book of Romans does is it takes them from the complete gospel and also it takes them not only from God's plan of salvation, why Jesus came, and also how to receive Christ, how to walk for Christ, and then what we do with Christ since we have him. Rome, Paul wrote this letter amazingly and answered so many questions. For those of you that are Bereans and enjoy reading the Word, how many times have you referred and referenced Romans for something that someone asked you about? I, I would say many, many times. But we can't go into chapter 13 without taking the context of chapter 12. And chapter 12 is an amazing chapter too. We know that Paul's addressing all these things and then he goes different things they're facing and they're challenging and reminding them of who they serve. You know, because what Paul knows is what we know. You know, I can, I can get mad at the world, but then when the Lord taps me on the shoulder and reminds me, son, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Right. When, you know, I can get as mad as I want to, and then all of a sudden the Lord taps me on the shoulder and reminds me, son, you're still blessed. You're still the most 90% wealthiest people in the world. I've given you much. I've, I've abundantly given you. And I told Tommy last night, I said, I'm 46 years old and I never dreamed I would feel this way. But God knew that we would face these challenges and the uncertainties of the day. Some of you say, Brother Steve, are you prophesying? Yeah, I'm prophesying. One of them's going to win. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And neither one of them, when, whenever one of them wins, the other party's going to be upset. Of course, we do know that one party's going to be more physically demonstrative and demonstrative than the other. But at the same time, there's going to be a nation. I remember, you know, folks that, that when President Trump won in 2016, said on the outside of the Capitol and screaming and hollering and just yeah. acting a fool. And, uh, you know, again, I, I love what Brother Holden said. We talked about this earlier, what that reminds us of instead of us looking at them. And it's been easy to say and have my own and develop my own opinions. But God, help us to say, God, that someone's lost. Yeah. And God, let me be concerned about their soul. Because yes. one day, I remember telling somebody to not talk to me about Jesus when I was into the world and doing the things that I, I wanted to do. I, or I wouldn't say it out loud, but boy, in my heart, I was like, I'm not ready to come back to the Lord. Don't talk to me right now. And some of you have gone through the very same thing. But when it's someone else, sometimes we forget we too stood in those shoes. That's right. We find that in Paul, in Paul writes in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I love it. We've been talking with our young people about our, uh, about our uh, memory verses. And Kaylin Kimberly is ready tonight to say her... No, I'm just kidding, baby. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, if you could have seen her eyes at me, I'm telling you. <laughs> Her face is ten times the shade of red. But anyway, um, but anyway, we've been working on putting words in our the word of God in our heart that we may not sin against Him. And and one of the, the first verses that I learned uh, was again Romans twelve one and two. And Paul, I learned it in the King James, so you can quote it with me. He said, "You know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service." Then be ye not conformed to the world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove which is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. And a lot of times, you know, we, we look at that scripture and we almost say, separate it. And we say, you know, well, well, you know, this is talking about me and, and my personal life. And yes, it is to a point, but if we take it in context and what Paul is leading up to, this is more than just your personal conduct with Christ, but how you represent Christ in the public square. That's right. How do you respond when things don't go your way? How do you respond when things go awry? How do you respond when someone's called you something or been mean to you or vile to you or vicious to you? I'm telling you, saints, I have to battle little Stephen because I want to respond. I've said things when I've seen the rioting and the looting and I've said things and said, oh God, if I was there. Well, what if I was there? <laughs> could, could I please the Lord? Now, let me, let me say this. I do believe as Christians we should defend ourselves if someone comes in my home. Of as a matter of fact, the Bible says, and not taking it out of context, but even a man who doesn't work for his wife and his family is worse than an infidel. What does it mean? You don't take care of them. Then in God's eyes, you're worse than an unbeliever. And, part of the, and, Paul, and Jesus talks about it. If the strong man had, not, had, had, had notified you when he would come, then you would have been there to defend your house. So I don't believe that there's anything necessarily wrong with defending your property, your home. That's what God's given you. But when it becomes vicious and vindictive and you're going to retaliate, that's when we're crossing a line. And I pray that God would help us as a Christian people. 
And you say, well, Brother Kimberly, it's easy for you to say this living in East Tennessee and not having to contend it. We're not in Baltimore. We're not in Maryland. We're not somewhere over here in, in uh, Oregon or, or New York. No, we're not. But the thing is, if we prepare in our heart and build this framework of thought in our spirit, maybe if we have to do something, we'll respond for what we prepared for. That's right. You know, in basketball, I remember when I ran in basketball, we would practice. Uh, we would start our practice months and months before season ever started. Because we had to get the framework of what we were doing ready before we actually got in um, to, to, to actually play the game. So we find here that, that Paul's setting this stage. And we know that Romans talks about that presenting our bodies. And we know that next that the Apostle Paul begins to talk. We'll skip on down to 9 through 3. We find that call, God calls us to love and to show everyone love. Not just those that we agree with, but those that, that, that are there. We love them. And that not one person, no matter what their calling or ability or anointing or preference, they're not above anybody. And that's the thing that I love because, to be honest with you, I used to believe that as a pastor, oh, I would stand before God and give some kind of, you know, and I will. I'll have to give an account for what I've done and how I've, I've, I've handled the Word of God, but some of you will have to do the same thing. And I truly believe that although I'll have to give an account for the, the, the calling of my life, when I stand before Jesus, I'm not going to stand before Jesus as Pastor Kimmery. But you know what? I'll stand before Jesus as Stephen. That's right. And what did I do? Yeah. And I will share with my young folks in the back, if they make me distracted, I will call their names. <laughs> All right. And then we find out that Paul later, he continues this. And, and as, as he begins to, to break this down, we find too that he, he even verse 14, 14 through 20, he says, even forgive those who have hurt you. You know, not just love each other no matter what, but also those who have done something against you, forgive them. You know, it's easy for us to forgive some, our own family. Let me ask you something. Why is it you think, and, I, and, and you can answer this if you want to, some have got sons and daughters who have treated you like complete doo-doo. <coughs> but then somebody that's not in your family says a cross word to you, hate them for years. Some of you go to the same family reunion every year and have that family member who treats you like you're dirt because, quote, unquote, your family, you go back every year, but you get, quote, offended in church, and that's supposed to be your spiritual family, and then you decide you'll never go back again. That's not right. Paul gave, or, or Jesus gave us a wonderful way of, of dealing with church hurts and how to deal with it. And we talked about that a little bit Sunday. You know, tell somebody, if you're sitting there hurting, and you don't tell anybody you're suffering, suffering needlessly. Because right. I guarantee you, one of two things are going to happen. If you've got a church hurt, or somebody's hurt you in the church, or somebody's offended you, whether it be me, or, you know, and the pastor's like, you know, we're easy to blame. Because we normally don't know anything about anything. I had somebody tell me one time, the reason they, well, well they didn't tell me. Somebody told me for them the reason that they left this church was because I said on Sunday morning, that if you didn't have a college education, uh, then you you weren't a smart person, and you just you just wasn't good enough. <laughs> oh, wow. I've never said anything to the, the sort, but somebody believed that statement of what I said. Not that they heard it for themselves, but coerced in believing it, and then the family leaves the church. And then when I address it, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. We're all right. And there's never that interaction of. This is what happened. And when that, that seed, what happens is seeds will grow one of two places. Seeds of, that bear fruit will go out to produce fruit. But seeds that bear bitterness grow inside in effect where nobody else can see it but you. And it does havoc and damage. We've got a beautiful uh, weeping willow tree in our, at our house. It's beautiful. I mean, it's a little chopped up right now, but, you know, it's still very pretty. But the thing that I've learned about it, is with the weeping willow especially, as much as you see on the outside of the ground, there's that much, if not more, on the inside of the ground. And I want you to know that you make the choice of how your seed of life will grow. If you take care of it as God would have you and not let anger and frustration and, and bitterness take root, then guess what? It's going to produce fruit and people are going to see the good works and glorify your Father. But if it grows inside, nobody's going to know what's wrong with you. Nobody's going to know how to help you. Nobody's going to know what to say to you. And all you're going to do is be tangled up and tied up in oppressions that you've not let God take care of. The enemy's afraid you're going to bring it to the light. Because if you bring it to the light, it can be healed. If you don't bring it to the light, then guess what? It won't be healed and it's just going to continue to fester 
And I don't know if that goes up north. Is it? Hey, some of my, my northern folks, you, does that fester? Does that go up north too? That's not just it. That's not. Maybe the way I say it, Southern. How do you say it? How do you say it in California? Fester. To fester. That's good. To fester. Down here we say fester. Not Uncle Festus, but fester. Makes you sore and it hurts and it's full of ooze. That's all I'm going to tell you. But anyway. Paul's telling them you've got to let this stuff go and realize it's your calling. It's not your own, your bodies, and your affection. And that's the thing that God helped me, Jesus, I have a hard time with. Because I want it my way. And I, because I am convinced my way is correct. But the thing is, too, someone else is as well. You know what I've learned about in, in this last, especially two years to be honest with you, since President Trump actually took office, one thing that I learned about the difference between a liberal and a conservative. Now, we can talk a lot about why and here and there, but I truly believe with all of my heart that one of the greatest differences is not the, not the thought itself, but the way someone thinks. There is a complete counter framework of thought than someone who is a, a conservative, truly, that's been raised that way and look at life that way, and someone who doesn't. And it, it's just a way of looking at life, a way of, of identifying with life. So when you look at someone and you say, well, why do you think the way you think? You know what I've always learned? They look right back at you and go, well, why do you think the way you think? I can't understand you at all. So what we have to do is understand, agree to disagree, and go forward. And if we've been offended, forgive. And if, we, if they don't forgive us, guess what? We'll forgive them anyway. I can remember I had hurt a family. I really had. I was a young kid and... and I had been hurt, and you know how it is when you're hurt. You don't mean to hurt somebody else, but your actions become greedy and selfish, and you wind up hurting somebody else. Yeah. Now, I know none of you have ever done that, but I have. Yeah. And I can remember I even had the guy, and he was well within his rights, looked at me. and Because I was, I was at that place, I was really trying to serve the Lord, but yet I wanted my own thing because, bless God, I've been hurt by somebody, and I deserve this. I deserve to do this. And bless God, I was a young teenager, young preacher by the age of 14. I was good as gold. Look what happened to me. And, and now, ain't that, you know, the enemy will always supply you excuses if you look for them. And I can remember he, he shook me. And those words he said, he's with, he's with the Lord now. He got saved. And I, I hope and pray he's just with the Lord tonight. But I can remember him standing on his porch. And I had no retort, no response for him. But he said, if people like you go to heaven, I'm glad I'm going to heaven. The reason was, is my testimony didn't line up with what I said I believed. Did he overstate it a little bit? Yeah, he said it out of anger. I know he did. And I wasn't intending to hurt anybody. But saints of God, again, our intentions don't matter when the results of our actions cause chaos. Just like when your kid looks at you and he just broke grandma's vase. It's irreplaceable. And he looks at you and he says, but I didn't mean to. Honey, I told you to quit running in the house. I told you to take it running outside. And now here's an irreplaceable heirloom that will never be back in your home again. Although you forgive them, will it make the heirloom come back together? No. Neither will our actions not have some kind of casualty on someone else. And Paul wanted the church to understand this. So no matter, I want to say the statement, no matter who's president, we still must show love one to another, especially in the house of faith. Amen. Remember what Jesus said. He said, they will know you're my disciples by your love one for another. And saints of God is the pastor here and is a leader and someone who loves the Lord. And I'm working on it myself. You may have passed by that person's yard and seen the biggest Biden sign you've ever seen in your life. Or you may have passed by their yard and seen a, a, a flag of, of Trump, Pence, and thought, dear God, how could they ever? But can I tell you something? If they're in Christ and you're in Christ, you better get right. Amen. And love them anyway. Yeah. Because the enemy is not happy with the divided nation. He wants a divided church. Mm -hmm. And if we don't straighten ourselves up, we will be that divided church. That's true. We've got to separate things. We've got to be willing to do that. Okay, let's look at what the Apostle Paul writing to the church here in Rome. And they're dealing with this. You know, America has never seen as a, as a Christian nation, and we were founded in Christian uh, Judeo-Christian principles. 
That's part of our history that you can try to erase and you can try to stamp up and say no. But it is, it is in the very cornerstones of the buildings in Washington, D.C., in the, in the Supreme Court. There used to be, actually, the Ten Commandments is the border. You actually could go down in some of the corridors and hallways and see these great paintings that were painted by artisans back in the days of our forefathers. And 90% of these paintings had to do with something with establishing the foundation of their faith. As a matter of fact, we learned that in the original colonies, many of those colonies didn't even think you should be allowed to be an American without being a Christian. Do you know that? It's an awesome foundation, but at the same time, we've allowed that foundation to arise. And we understand we're a nationalist, we're not a theist nation, we're not a theocracy, we're a democracy or a republic. So we've allowed and we do allow, and I believe we do need to allow people of all faiths, creeds, nationalities to live in this nation and benefit from it if they're willing to surrender to the laws of this land and do things the right way. I've got a friend of mine that I've met who's a, who's a guy from Brazil. He works out at the gym with me. And, and the plant, I know many of you know down here at the plant, and, uh, is, uh, is closing its doors down here at what used to be the TRW plant. And, uh, and I was talking to him, and, and he's got it, you know, he's had his green card, and, and now he's working. He and his family love it here and would love to stay. But he looked at me and he said, he said, Stephen, I want you to know. He said, I, I know it's expensive and I know I have to go. But you know what? I came in this nation in the, the, through the front door and I want to leave this nation back through the same door I came in. I mean, come on. That's all any of us would ever ask. And before someone says that's not biblical, you need to read the Old Testament. The New Testament cannot be compared to our national uh, estate. The New Testament is about the gospel and the church. The Old Testament deals with how God dealt with the nation of Israel. That's right. And he did tell about the proselyting and bringing them in, but you never read in Scripture where, the, the, where, where we had the, uh, the, the uh, Philistine come in and say, hey, I'm going to live in Jerusalem. Just let me pack up and build next to the temple. No. They had to make sure who was in, the, in, in Israel. They had to, 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 to meet the criteria and the requirement. I mean, come on, folks. It's just common knowledge. But what if you don't agree with that? Well, that's okay. We don't have to agree. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. So let me get back to the main thing tonight. If, you would, if you're with me in Romans chapter 13, say amen. amen. Paul writes this. He says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. Now remember, he wasn't talking to a people who were having a good time with their government. You remember what I, I, I talked to you before? He's writing this to a people who they had lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost their possessions. Many of them had lost their families and lost their freedoms. And don't you think they wanted to revolt? Don't you think they wanted to take arms, get their buddies together, and go, go take some heads? And Paul says, listen, God's got a plan. Wait a minute. Don't assert God's authority. Who do we know that assert God's authority? Remember Abraham and Sarah? I was reading that. I believe it was in Genesis. What is it? Genesis 12. I was reading that today. And how do we know that the prophets or the angels came to, to Sarah and, or Sarai and Abram? And Abram was under the tree. And all of a sudden, these three were fixing to go pass judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. But they come. They stop. And they look at Sarah. And they look at Abram. And I love Abram's response. He knows they're of God. And all of a sudden, he kills the lamb. And, or not the lamb, but a, a fatted calf. And he, gets, he says, oh, honey, get a ton of flour. And let's make them some bread. Bless the Lord. See, bread and meat was a part of God's plan from the beginning. Amen. <laughs> I don't know if there'll be vegetarian plates at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm just telling you that right now. Uh, again, my opinion, my opinion. You may be a vegetarian, you can. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But we find that Abram came and all of a sudden they said, Sarah, you're going to have a child. And when she heard it, she laughed and then she lied about it. So no, I didn't laugh. They said, no, we heard you. You said, you laugh. <laughs> you know, the Lord knows what we think, not just what we say. Amen. <laughs> We like to whisper it under our breath, but God hears it and understands it. And then we understand, too, that because of that promise, and that promise was not fulfilled immediately. We know that years went by, and because Sarah felt like her time was up, and she wasn't going to be able to fulfill this promise so that Abram could have a seed or have an heir. She gets Hagar, his, his young servant girl, and says, all right, buddy, we're going to be a, you know, we, we can be swingers, and you're going to go take her and have yourself a kid. 
And we know the, the catastrophe that that had. When we don't allow God to process us or allow us to walk through the process and we want to skip ahead, we cause more problem than we cause good. And family, I'm telling you, you know, there's a lot of stars right now that say if Trump wins, and he still could, but, you know, if Trump wins, I'm going to Canada. Well, what, what's that proving? <laughs> These are supposed to be adults. Yeah. If Bob oh, Trump wins, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, I, I, who, who, one of them said, I'm going to Australia. And I thought to myself, you think them folks in Aussie land really want you? I mean, come on. <laughs> But all I'm saying is this, is that really how we're to respond? No. Could it be that maybe God's going to use some things if they happen to wake the church up? Because I'm telling you, what we've seen in the voting, what we've seen across this nation, I mean, we went through this in 2016. Yeah. I don't know if many of you realize or not what was going on in Texas in 2016. They were asking for pastors to turn in their sermons to make sure that their sermons were politically correct enough to not be prosecuted. You have to realize, too, that they were coming against in certain areas of people even congregating together in homes and having churches in the United States of America. And we prayed and we saw God, and not that God gave us Trump like some knight in shining armor, but he gave us four years of at least we had a, 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 a national a president who at least come and said that the church is essential. I'll never speak against the church. Again, he wasn't a pastor. Oh, he slept with a prostitute. Well, do we really want to go through the presidents one by one and see how many illicit affairs they've all had? <laughs> well, my favorite ones. I did not know that woman, you big liar. <laughs> but either way, we know that it's corrupt and we cannot put a religious pressure upon someone. Oh, you can't, how can you be a Christian? Come on, guys, let's not go there. Because yeah. that is a never-ending question. I've asked that myself. But you know what? Again, someone who has a different framework of thought will look at me and say, and I have been asked, how could you be a Christian and vote the way that you vote? But guys, again, I can have my opinion. I can have my biblical opinion. But when my biblical opinion begins to divide and separate and beat you up and I begin to demean you because you don't think and feel the way I do, I'm telling you guys, we're causing more problem than we're causing good. Yeah. I told, I told somebody one time as Crossroads Assembly, I want us to be a church that welcomed all people. I thank God that we're not a white church. I thank God that we're a church of diversity. I, and, and our diversity reflects our community. We're not a very diverse community. So we're not an incredibly diverse church. But we do have diversity within our church. And we do have people from many different backgrounds. I've seen people walk in our church who come from a Catholic background. They don't do it anymore, but when they first came, I remember them walking through the door, step, sitting down, crossing themselves before they ever sit on the seat. None of us ever run to them and say, Oh, Lord, 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 gosh, gosh, I shouldn't have run church. <laughs> but we allow them to continue what made them feel comfortable until what time we could walk them through and let them see as Protestant, Christian, Pentecostal believers, we don't have to do such formality to come to Christ. And I've learned that if you walk with somebody instead of demanding them to go, it, it gets a whole lot easier. Oh, yeah. So we find that the Apostle Paul's writing to them, and he's not telling them to do something he's not done because he wrote him to Corinthians a little bit earlier. Remember, he told them, he said, listen, guys, I've been through this and 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 this. And I'm not gave up, so don't you give up either. Verse 2, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against God who instituted instituted and those who do will bring judgment on themselves i mean you may have a, a king jimmy version you may have an ESV, a message it don't get any plainer than that right. well if he wins i'm gonna you're gonna what <laughs> you better hit your knees and just pray for him yeah. no matter who's in office pray well what if he what if what if they have abortion clinics on every corner well you know what we can do we can pray yeah. see god's face if we can sign petitions, let's sign petitions. If we can, if, and I believe as nationalists, as Americans, we can protest without making it physical. That's right. I think that's our right. It is. And it's not unbiblical, but when we begin to hate someone and, 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 and despise someone simply based upon a difference of opinion and a difference of attitude, then guess what? Yeah. I, heard it say, I heard it said before that one thing in America, we used to send missionaries out, and now they're sending missionaries to America. The fields are wide and ready in the harvest. Yes. 
Guys, we don't even have to. You know, I love missions trips, and I, I'm not called to be a missionary, but I'm telling you what, we're in America, and this is a mission field. That's right. Amen. Millions of votes. And I wonder how many of those people that voted on either side ever thought about the biblical ramifications of pushing that button? Yeah. <coughs> That's my big question. All right, guys. Paul continues to write for the rulers. Uh, hold no terror to those who do right and to those who do wrong. Do you want to be free and, 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 and fear, uh, fear? Let's see. Do you want to be free from fear of one in authority? Then do what's right and you will be commended. Now, I don't, I'm telling you again, we have, they're not every cop that, that puts on a badge is, is, is corrupt, but not everyone is, is trustworthy either. I've heard it said before, there's an old statement that says, is, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And yes, there are those who have hidden their, their internal biases and prejudice, and when they put that badge on, they go out and they've done things that they shouldn't do. But 90% of those cops want to serve you and love you and be good to you. And I've learned in my life, even when I was arrested one time in my life for a bounce check, it was a $4 and something check that wound up costing me over $400 when it was all said and done. But I also remember that when I came in polite and nice and kind, not one of them threw me in the pokey and beat me with an ugly stick. What could it possibly happen? It happened to Paul. Don't forget, Paul was beaten. He didn't do anything. Remember when Jesus went into, into, into the, the hall with the Pharisees and Sadducees? They slapped him in the face and they pulled his beard as an insult to him. Jesus didn't utter his word like a lamb led to the slaughter. He never opened his mouth. Sometimes, yes, unprovocated bad things still happen to good people. But again, saints of God, we've got to be careful and respond how God would have us to respond. Amen. Verse 4, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For the rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants and agents of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. That's, again, our police departments and those who are trying, our, our officers in uniform, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Marine Corps Coast Guard, Air Force. Yeah. Thank God for them. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Because again, all oh, well, war's not Christian. No, it's not. But the defense of a nation has been in the in the Bible since day one. That's right. Very true. Very, very true. Remember to protect the Garden of Eden from sin and the sinful people. What did God do? He put a little candy. He put a little candy cane outside the Garden of Eden. He said, "Now listen, don't go no further here." No, he said, "A big old bad angel at the door." That's right. Come on, guys. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities not only because it's possible for punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. You listen. Again, we may face a day, I hope not, but we may face a day that it's illegal to be gathered together. And at that time, we'll have to make that distinction. In California, they had to make the distinction. They had, a, they had an eating that came from the governor. You will not, and we know they were fined and fined again. And they stood, and we've applauded that. I did, would still applaud that. We ourselves took a risk and come back together into the assembling of ourselves together when many were saying, oh no, don't dare do it. But we felt it was time. We saw yes. numbers go down. We're trying to be wise and God's blessed us for that. Yes, we have had folks that's had COVID, but we tried to do it the best way. We didn't do it as a revolt and a, and a thumb to the government, but what we really did was we felt we heard the Lord say, now it's the time. Yes. And you know what? God has so blessed us because of that. Yes, he so again, there's a time and a place, but if we're doing it for rebellious sake, that's not what God would have us to begin to do. So this is only why you, uh, also why you pay taxes. Taxes ain't Jesus. Well, you, we need to read Scripture. If you're a part of a nation, you will pay taxes. You may not like it, but you got to pay taxes. I hated it going down to Florida. One thing I love, no, I'm rephrase that. That sounds awful. I love going to Florida. It's my home away from home. I wish I missed Navarre. Uh, I'm going through withdrawals as I talk about it. Um, in 2018, we got to go to Florida twice, one for vacation, the other for my graduation. So when I went to graduation, we went to a place called Lakeland, which is down close to the central Florida. And when you pass the, the Panhandle and go down into more central Florida, they have what's called toll roads. You're going to pay them. 
You think you can skim by and think of these fancy dancy cameras better than any camera I've seen here in East Tennessee? Yeah. And honey, they not only when they take that picture, they know how many times you've been through that toll. They'll take your face, they can get you front and back. And then I couldn't even tell them I was calling you. They knew who I was. <laughs> and then they sent me this beautiful letter in the mail said, hey, you passed this toll, and here's your picture. We expect this money. And guess yeah. what we did? We paid that money. But one thing I'll tell you this, I've never seen more beautiful on-ramps and off-ramps and well-taken-care-of grounds. And I'll tell you what, the roads were pristine. So, I mean, they're using the money the way I guess it should be used. But again, if you're part of a community, you have to do that kind of thing. And again, it's not unbiblical to be asked to participate in your community. Give to everyone what is owed them. And if you, if you owe taxes, pay taxes. If, if, if revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. Honor them, then honor them. Saints of God, again, I am, I am battling this in my own heart. But dear God, if this election goes the way I don't want it to, God help me not to get on Facebook and make an idiot of myself. And God help me not to stand in the corner and stick together and and because again, like it or not, that's going to be our president. And I challenge you, let's put God first. I know it's cliche, but let's not lean so much to the, to the donkey or the elephant. Come on, guys, those, those animals will perish. We're serving the Lamb of God. That's right, man. And maybe what if, that, what if that person's a liberal and they're lost? Yeah. And if you've made an enemy of them simply because you don't like the way they think, man, you're never going to win them to Jesus. In the same way as the conservative. I, I hate to tell you, but everybody who voted for Donald Trump's not a Christian. <laughs> really, believe it or not. Really, I don't believe so. But you know what's amazing to me? That if you can maybe not offend and be hateful, who knows, you may get an audience with them be able to lead them to Jesus. Yeah. Remember, Paul was telling the church of Rome, they were the church of Rome. And their cause, their, their position, their whole purpose was not to rebel against Rome and start a nationality of Christianity or, or start an emperor church. They were to be the evangelists to Rome and they knew they couldn't do that if they were rebellious and, 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 and being offensive rather than being congenial and saying, I'm part of Rome and if I mean taxes, taxes. What did Jesus tell them? You know, it was a Roman law that if you, if, if you were a Jew and you were walking beside someone that was a Roman, a, a, a Roman soldier, their pack, how much was their pack with a hole? It's like 60, 70 pounds, something like that. It was their extra, extra armor and extra everything like that. It was by law that they could look at you and say, Randy, carry this. And you were by law expected to carry that one mile. And Jesus said, don't just carry it one, carry it two. We forget those things. We forget that Jesus wants us to love our neighbor. Love those who, despite, who spitefully use us. Oh, it's hard to do, boys. I'm telling you what. That's why Paul started this whole section two. He said to, to submit yourselves unto God. Submit your bodies, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable to God. He paid for you lock, stock, and barrel. How many of y'all have a car out there that you rode in today? What if you want to use your trunk and haul some fire with it? Yeah, it's your truck. You own it. Go ahead. I like that, Sister Don. Go ahead. Even if, you know, one thing, if it's your house, I saw my Sister Debbie about this. When they go to Ohio, we're going to miss them like crazy. But they're going to be in a condo up there. And most condos that I'm used to, at least on the inside, you can decorate them the way you want to. You know what's amazing about our house, Tanya? Of course, it's Tanya's house. I get to live there. And uh, thanks for letting me live there, baby. But anyway... <clears throat> She saw a stranger and took him in. Amen. But anyway, you know the thing I've learned about them rooms? It may have been originally built to be a bedroom, but if my wife says, honey, we're going to make this an office, guess what that becomes? An office. My wife looked at our kitchen, our, our, our dirt on the outside and says, we need a room right here. And guess what's standing there today? There's a room right there. <laughs> Why? It's because we, we may not, the bank owns it, but they let us do with it what we want to. Jesus owns you. You're bought with a price. He didn't, he, you, you forfeited your ability or rights to Christ. And that's the thing. And I'm not, I, I wish, you know, I, I'm preaching this tonight and I'm teaching this tonight. And I want you to know that I'm teaching it as a failed, fragile, messed up Christian when it comes to this stuff. Because by golly, I always tell y'all, you know, this ain't white, but I, I wear a lot of white collared shirts. But if you look under here, there's a big old red neck that goes under this white shirt. <laughs> And I want to tell you my opinion, bless God, and if you don't like it, you get a what? You know, that's our nature, but we've got to, we've got to have a new nature, amen? A new nature.
nature. Isn't that what Jesus said? New nature? Amen. All right, let's continue on. Verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except continuing, uh, except the continuing debt of love to one another. If you owe somebody money, pay them. Church had to pay $177 water bill. You know why? It's because when we had our bathrooms built, there was a, in the fittings, some of you know what I'm talking about, you know, the float and everything goes inside the mechanism of the toilet that controls the water. There was a rubber band that helped that mechanism work, and it had snapped and got between the flap and the, and the ending, and it was letting water pour. Over 10,000 gallons of water flowed through that thing. And the thing is, there was no water pressure that we could tell it had released. It was all good. Some of you ladies, it was Esther's court. We've had, everything was great. And then all of a sudden, I get the phone call, and I said, Lord, this thing up here at your water meters is spinning like you wouldn't believe. You want it? I'm like, ooh, Jesus. Because you know what I did? I didn't go fight with them and fuss with them. My golly, I represent you. And God's blessed us. We could pay that bill. And I went, and I said, you know what? I, I found the rubber band. We looked through it, and I fixed it. And praise God, I think we're good. Let me know if that thing even begins to leak again. And here's the money. See, saying to God, again, we're Christians, but it doesn't mean we get a free ride. That's right. That's right. I've never been able to go down here to the Walmart and say, now glory to God, brothers and sisters. I'm a man of God, man of the cloth, and I need a loaf of bread. I bring to you the bread of life. Can you bring me a bread that I can take home? You know? I have had people do that. I've had people that are around. There was a guy in Greenville, bless God. He was a simply God pastor, too. And uh, he actually got kicked out of the local one of the local car dealerships because he wanted to give him a car for free because he was pastor. <laughs> he would literally, he would, he would really negotiate the prices low. I mean, the, the, from what I understood, they talked to me about it. The salesperson, because he was a pastor, would literally sell him a car without any commission or barely even commission enough to make his time. And then as soon as he'd get to sign the table, the preacher would go, I don't want this car. And he'd go, leave. And he'd do that repeatedly. And finally, I was actually, I think the Lord, it was, it was divine appointment because I was in the car dealership when they said, preacher, don't come back. <laughs> and I didn't blame him. I remember saying, well, where does he pastor? And they said, this church or assembly of God down here. I said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not assembly of God. <laughs> now look at me now. <laughs> That's it. How are you? There you go. No offense to any of our Catholic or Lutheran viewers. We love you. And... Amen. But yeah. But again, guys, you only have one opportunity to make an impression. And, and that's what Paul's telling them. If you owe something, pay it. Be reasonable in your actions. Even when they're unreasonable, that doesn't give you a right to be reasonable. Or unreasonable. Verse 9, the, com uh, the commandments... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, you shall not uh, whatever another or other command there, there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You want to bless the Lord, love your neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? You remember Jesus mentioned that. Yeah. And as Pam said, it, it's anybody. Listen, I've got people I know in my community that are my physical neighbors, but I also have people in this community that I don't live next to. But I'm responsible. I, I, I want to represent Christ well to them. There's been times I've represented Christ. I felt good about it. There were times I said, Shoo, Lord, forgive me. It's not a really good representation. But you know, saints of God, we're supposed to be the light of the world. And there's a lot of things going on in our lives right now, whether the election or anything else, COVID. Oh, God help us. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement, we've got the Antifa uh, uh, terrorist organization. Yes, I said that, because if you destroy America and burn buildings, that's not political, that's terrorism. That's right, that's right. That's right. And there's a lot that wants to make our lives that, and also, like I said, the division within the church. And people, I know there's people that says, you know what, Brother Kimberly, I'm not coming to church till after election, because I don't want you to say anything that makes me mad. Are we really there? And I hate to tell you, but whether you like it or not, you're, you, are, you have the right to have an opinion. Can you hear an amen? amen. But so do I. Amen. Amen. But where my opinion stops is when I become a divider and not a reconciler. What the Bible say? That we're being given the spirit of reconciliation. 
Sometimes we don't act like it, do we? No. Verse 11, this is what, and I'm going to conclude with this here tonight, and this is what we're really going to bring it in. Because we've got to realize, you don't have to be a, a, a prophet of God to understand, but the Lord's coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Paul wanted to remind the church of Rome, and even in their day, they believed with all their heart that the Lord would come again. Mm -hmm. And some of you say, well, Brother Stephen, what if the Lord doesn't? Well, what if he doesn't? But what if he does? Because yeah. we have to realize the Lord's coming. It may not be the rapture for you and I, but some of us here tonight may meet the Lord before we realize it. Yeah. Last year alone, it breaks my heart to even think about it. Those that we actually preached their funeral for. Mm -hmm. This year, I preached funeral for people that may be a little more aged, but some that were even younger than myself. Mm -hmm. One was a young lady that her husband, they had a wonderful meal. She'd been very sick, but they had a wonderful meal. He drops her off, kisses her, said, I'll see you when I get home from work. When he gets home from work, she's gone. 43 years young. See, family of faith, I'm telling you, we are going to meet the Lord. And we cannot bypass that. It's, it's, it, we're on that road to meet Jesus. And verse 11 says, Do this understanding that we, in the present time, that the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because of your salvation is nearer than what, uh, than, than what we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. How many have ever been around a suit of armor? Fake or otherwise. It didn't have to be, you know, Henry VIII or Henry VI or whatever armor, but you know, you still see it and it's very cumbersome. And very, even, even the Roman armor was very cumbersome to put on and wear in certain ways of latching it and things. You cannot put on the armor of God unintentionally. You can't slip into it like a, you know, like you, you, your slippers on 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 uh, Sunday night. And I do want to confess something to you. We discontinued our Sunday evening services, so about 5:30, I'm in PJs and I've slipped into my into my slippers. And now that I have a recliner, that recliner is back. I've got a cup of coffee in my hand, love and life. I'm just being honest with you. And uh, but you know the thing is 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 that's not how we put on the armor of God. We have to do it strategically. As a matter of fact, back in the, the days of the knights, they had pages that helped the knights to get into their armor. And if you've ever done any research on it, I know Kip can tell you too, there were some armors that had keys that you had to actually unlock and lock and tighten with keys to make sure that they would fit. And what Paul's saying is, is we've got to be strategic about the armor of God that we put on our bodies, yes. in our minds, in our hearts. Yes. It's not going to just slide up because you believe in Jesus. You've got to make sure that you physically, that you mentally put on the armor. Some people have even, I remember one pastor or evangelist that I listened to said that when, he'll, when he wakes up in the morning, and I'm not just religious about anything, but he wakes up in the morning and say, God, I put on the helmet of salvation. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, and I, I mean, that's not me. But still, I can say, God, protect my mind. God, protect my heart. God, help me prepare to give the gospel, not just my own spewing opinion. God, prepare my feet to go in a direction you prepared. And, and sometimes, guys, the, the feet that we go, God may be leading us to go somewhere we don't want to go. That's true. Yep. I'm reminded of Philip, the, the, uh, who went before the Ethiopian eunuch. Could you imagine? I mean, all of a sudden, you're walking along, and the Lord says, Go there. You've been preaching revival, glory to God, doctor. Good old revival. <laughs> You've been preaching it. Uh, and all of a sudden the Lord says, go witness to that uh, very wealthy eunuch. For one thing, a eunuch wasn't a man, if you know what I mean. They had been emasculated surgically. Yeah. But he was over the Ethiopia, the queen of Egypt. He was over all of her, or Ethiopia, all of her wealth. And all of a sudden he'd been entrusted with that. But he had heard the gospel and he had, had purchased some scrolls. And he's reading these scrolls. And in, God, and, 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 and be, in spite of the, what he, he looked, let me ask you this. I'm not saying, I'm just letting my mind go. But what, is, what if he was infeminate? He, he was with women all the time. His manhood had been taken. He dressed in silks. He dressed in fine apparel. What if he was a little infeminate? And, Paul, and Jesus said, I don't care what he looks like or talks like. He's got a soul and I want you to tell him. That's right. And saying to God, my heart is God help us. No matter what we're doing to go where Jesus says go. Amen. And maybe God's going to bring people to us. And sometimes when God brings people before you, they're not always happy. Right. 
One thing about being a pastor, and I know Kip can tell you, and I know Holden can tell you as a leader too, I know Dom can tell you and others, normally when people want to talk to you about Jesus, they're not in a good position. I've always wondered, I wish people could come to me 10 months or a month before they get into the worst trouble of their life. <laughs> this is normally how it goes. And I'm not belittling, and if you call me, I love you, you're welcome to call anytime. But this is normally how my life goes as a pastor and has for 20 years. 3 o'clock in the morning. Brother Kipper, my family's crumbling. I'm in, I'm in dire straits. You're going to cut my lights off tomorrow. Can you do anything? And it's 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Why? How long have you known that your lights were going to be cut off? I've known for two months. <laughs> How long have you known your marriage was in trouble? Well, for about a year now we've been struggling. And you now wait till everything is at the point of failure. And then as a last ditch effort, you go, oh, preacher, oh, preacher, oh, preacher. Yep. And Sister Carol can tell you, we do our best in the faith and the love of the Lord. But dear God, if somebody could give you at least a month or two in advance, we could probably. You know, I've learned that I can help you out of the mud hole a whole lot quicker than I can help you out of the Grand Canyon. I'm just telling you that right now. That's true. But what if we begin to do what Paul says? And what if we begin to love people in spite of themselves and in spite of our own abilities and our own things and our own feelings and our own separations? And what if we just love folks? Saints of God, I'm telling you, you're still an American. I was listening the other day, and, and please don't judge me. And one of my daughters, in which I'm not going to say which, talked me into downloading, uh, what is it? Uh, TikTok. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. It's a warning. Don't. Don't do it. Your time, you, you'll be watching it and flipping and look up and an hour is gone. You're like, what happened? <laughs> but one thing I love, I, didn't get to, I did not serve. I did not choose to serve in the military. But at the core of who I am, I am probably as patriotic a human as you'd ever meet. I love the 4th of July. I love airplanes. I love to see the military. When we go, when we would go to Navarre, we would always go down uh, to Pensacola and go visit those Navy uh, Blue Angels and just enjoy ourselves. And I've seen them four times, and they still give me goosebumps every time. I love it. Yes. I even got to see these little youngins, 21, 22 years old captains, who get off these things. Half my size, half my weight, ten times my intellect. And I enjoy talking to them. But... But with that, with that said, you know, the thing that I want you to know that if we could only be as spiritually patriotic as we are physically, I think it would challenge a lot of how we think. Don't you? Amen. All right, let's go on. All right, let's look down at verse 13. I'm going to conclude this thing up. It says, let us behave decently as in daytime, not carousing and drunkenness and sexual immorality and debauchery and dissension and jealousy. Now, if we take this in context and everything that's said, what do you think Paul's saying? This isn't out by itself. My personal opinion is Paul's saying, don't let your surroundings cause you to act like an unbeliever. Right. You see where I got that? He's been talking about keeping our bodies under subjection. Not thinking more highly of ourselves than our own. We all love our neighbor, love those who spotfully use us. Then he talks about how we're to treat the government. Don't let this push you. And then he says, don't act like an idiot because you're unhappy. Guys, you know what? The world won't see you in here. One thing I love about the gym, and I, I don't work around with a lot of people, and the people that I work around are Christians and believers, but every once in a while we get those unbelievers, and I get to, I get to hear them, hear the words and their language and sort of things they do. I scream and holler, I just don't cuss. Amen? I get loud. Go see some of the videos. I embarrass Kaylin to death. You know? <laughs> I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing. You know, this is great. But anyway, the thing that I've learned is, is that's where God wants us many times to be. If you're not around someone who's lost, you're not out there enough. That's right. That's true. So how can we win? I mean, we can't just keep winning the people that's in the same pond we're in. No. I mean, that's silly. That's are we really are we really promoting Christ when we just take someone from one pond and put them in another pond and say, Woo! they're in my pond. No, God wants us to, to be winning the lost. And Amen. One thing that the Apostle Paul's reminding him just, you know, the thing is, the lost ain't going to see you in church, but they're going to see you in the world. Right. What's funny, you go where they are and act like they do, they'll pick you out quick. Tell you a story real quick. It's just 735. Amen. I can tell you real quick. <laughs> there was a, used to be a motorcycle group 
with the Assemblies of God, we've got an amazing motorcycle group um, through Honorbound, Honorbound Ministries. And uh, they're just awesome, and they travel all over. But there used to be, I think the group was either the Sons of Jesus or Sons of, sons of God. And if, I'm, if you're a part of that and, and they're still active, forgive me. But from what I understand, there was a group similar to that who was out running the roads, and a couple of their members had what's called their colors. Their colors is that big patch that goes on the back of their vest, and they had their vest and their motorcycles. And a couple of them thought, well, you know what, there's a biker bar about 50 miles up the road where the war kings and this one and that one are at, so that's where we're going to go, because I'm tired. I'm a real biker. Maybe I may be Jesus, but today I want to have me some beers and sit around and act like a rough folks, and that's what I'm going to do, and that's exactly what they did. They got in there, and they went in there, and they wore their colors, and that biker bar it says sons of Jesus or sons of God, and there they are drinking their beer, sun hitting each other, and some of you may debate and say, well, you know what? I have the freedom in Christ to do that. You can't tell me that I'm lost, but the sinner don't look like, don't think of it like that. They look at you doing the things that they've been called they're going to hell for. And if you're doing that, whether you feel you have the liberty to do it or not, they're going to look at you and say, well, dear God, who they think they are. That's right. Because now it's their turn to pick on you and say, you saying, oh, you're not going to heaven. Now they're going to say, well, what are you doing? Uh -huh. So all of a sudden they're sitting there drinking their beer, thinking they're having themselves a good time, shooting them a good game of pool. And about the time, I think it was one of the big, big motorcycle games was there. And they went up to them and they said, hey, boys. He said, what's them colors on your back? He said, yeah, we're, yeah, we're a biker group, little sons of God. He said, ain't y'all a Christian group? He said, well, yeah. He said, but now before you get on to us, if we had a night, we figured we'd just be like you boys. He said, oh, so you want to, true story, true story. Wow. You can ask some people, Pastor Bob Brown down here, he told me the story, it really happened. He said, so you all want to be real bikers, huh? I said, yeah, baby, we're real bikers. And those in the real biker game, ripped their clothes off them, tore their patches off their back, sent them out naked from that bar. Oh. Then they contacted the president of their organization and said, if we see you out with that patch from what you've done, we will do the same to them. Mm. What are you saying, Brother Kim? Are you saying that that's offensive to me? No, it's not. We're the light of the, the world. We're God's light. We're refractive, refractives of his light. And if we're not going to do it, guess what? There's ramifications. And what did Jesus say? If we're a stumbling block to one of the little ones? Verse 14. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean when, when that scripture says, and you clothe yourselves? Guess what? I can't anoint you with oil that you be clothed with the word of God. I can't anoint you. I can't pray for you. I can't speak in tongues over your life. I can't prophesy to you and make you live what God would have you to live. Paul's writing to Rome, and I love Paul's writing. He's so straight up, and he's like, you better clothe yourself. Yeah. You put your own clothes on. Yeah. You, you decide how you're going to act and what you're going to do and how you're going to represent Jesus. He says, you put your clothes, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And I'm going to close with this. Guys, as we see our nation again, it may be that we have four more years with President Donald John Trump. But we may have four years with, with Mr. Biden and Kamala Harris. We may have eight years with, with them. Do you realize that there is a condition or a clause in our, in our uh, Constitution that is something that we know that President or uh, Vice President Biden... There's no way. This is my opinion. You can hate me if you want to. Thumbs down, whatever. But there's something going on with him mentally. He can't remember his speeches. He's already said three to four different times that he's not running for the presidency. He's running for the Senate. He's already even told them one thing he was at. And you can look it up. It's not, I'm not picking on the man. It's, it's there. Also, there was a time that he even said, too, that, that uh, he was Kamala's running mate. So there's something going on. There's something. That, and you realize that if he serves two years... And then, then he cannot, because you know that Nancy Pelosi's already mentioned that, what, what is it, the uh, um, 45th Amendment or 25th Amendment about if a president cannot complete, then, yes. then what that would happen was is then Ms. Kamala would come over as president, and if I'm understanding my policies right, then Pelosi, as the Speaker of the House, would be the vice. Yeah. No. no, that wouldn't work. But, but Kamala would be, and she'd have to pick someone, I guess. She'd have to pick someone, and then that person has to be approved by Congress. So have to be approved by Congress. But that would be a shift. And she could fulfill the rest of Biden's and run for two more terms. Yes. yes. 
So again, guys, what if that happens? What if it does? We're going to pray for them. We're going to lift them up. In your house, in your closed doors, you work it out, you, your family, and Jesus. But when you are talking to your brothers and sisters in Christ, don't let things that offend you cause you to offend somebody else. Do you feel like that we went through chapter 13 and do you feel like I've been right in what I said? Do you feel like that we've interpreted scripture appropriately? And we have to live it, don't we? It's not easy. I told you I'm a redneck from way back. I'm a redneck. I like my guns. I like my freedom. I like all that good stuff. I like to know that I went to the gas station this morning and my gas was $1.80 a gallon. Hallelujah. You know why? It's what? Because we drill and we do things and we, we produce our own fuels. Glory to God. But you know what? What if that changes? And in about three or four years, we still take more than that. But what if, what if the new Green Deal comes in? We go to pay and we, we're still driving fossil fuel cars and it's $20 a gallon. We don't know. But the one thing that we do know is God's in control. Let's not let fear dictate our mind. But let's speak in faith, live in faith. Build this construct of faith in our own life. And you know what? You're going to have to do it every day. Because I guarantee you, I'm going to share this with you, I go home, and if I turn that news on and it ain't what I want to hear, I'm going to have to say, Jesus, 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 help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. <laughs> but you know what? You'll have to do the same yourself. Amen. 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 All right, guys, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight and thank you for all that you do. And I pray this has been a word of comfort. <coughs> God, for those, you know, we're, God, we're as Americans, Lord, we've never seen this before, many of us. God, we've not seen this kind of, as a nation, this kind of division since the Civil War. And God, even the word Civil War, or the term Civil War has even been mentioned, even in our modern language. And God, that should not be. Lord, we forgot how to compromise. We forgot how to get along. We forgot to put our... Our, our problems or our enemies first and not fight one another. But God, we've become very, in it, very, very dogmatic and God, we've been very polarizing not only in the world, but God, we've let that bleed over to our church and God, would you please forgive us? God, we're allowed to have an opinion. We're allowed, God, to have an opinion different than what others think should be the norm. But God, we can't demand our opinion above what we demand the love that you have commanded us to show one for another. God, I pray that if we can't speak civilly, then let's not speak. If we can't act civilly and with love, then God, maybe we just can't act right now. But God, give us your grace and your mercy. And let us from being reminded of Romans chapter 13 and know that we are still proud to be an American. I know America's got our problems. I know we're not perfect, but no nation in this earth is. We've had horrendous histories. We've done horrendous things. But God, also, we've accomplished great goods. And God, I just pray that you continue to keep your hand upon us as Americans. That we could be your champions for Israel. Yes. That God, we could be the most benevolent nation as we have been, God, for all these other nations. That God, we can be benevolent and loving and caring. But God, let it begin in us because we cannot give another nation what we don't possess. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Can we all say? Amen. Amen. And love you. See you Sunday. God bless.